Kentucky, and uh, thanks for spending some time with us today. Um, you'll notice that we're, uh, we're going to be uh, really uh, making a, a common commentary on whether DGA is more art or science. And, you know, with the proper application of science, we can actually derive a lot more information from your existing DGA data. And let me just, there we go, change my pointer here. So I'll just touch on the fundamental principle of dissolved gas analysis and how it's used. Um, speak more specifically about, and you'll find with us because we, we work very hard to, uh, to apply first principle science. Uh, one of our little pet peeves right now of how DGA is treated. We'll introduce the scientific method and then show you how we apply the scientific method to come up with a different way of interpreting DGA data. Okay, what is dissolved gas analysis? Well, <clears throat> you know, the, the basic essence of it is, you know, transformers designed to operate uh, without a problem under normal, uh, normal conditions. So if, if its insulation systems are being damaged uh, during normal operation, you have a problem. And uh, if those insulation systems are breaking down, well, that's where dissolved gas analysis comes in and starts detecting those byproducts. You know, it's a fairly inexpensive, non-invasive, non-disruptive method. It is a key inspection um, and normally the, the, you know, a leading indicator of a problem inside your transformer. Transformer experts use this information, you know, to decide whether they're gonna continue operation of that transformer, whether they should change the inspection schedule, um, whether additional maintenance should occur. This is a, a, a primary um, source of information for the transformer expert to make decisions of, uh, of how to um, treat that particular asset. Okay, and it's all in the name of, you know, managing risk, knowing it's not a perfect world, you don't have perfect information, you want the best information possible and have confidence in that information, okay? And when <clears throat> one of the things I wanna emphasize here is, you know, dissolved gas analysis doesn't tell you what to do. It gives you an indication that you ought to do something or not, okay? It's up to the transformer expert to do that. And that transformer expert probably does not wanna rely on uh, this person to help you with that. And this is where, where we get a little bit challenged because the IEEE guideline for interpreting DGA data in 2008 version, it stated that DGA is not a science but an art. And they did a revision in 2019 and it was said again that it's more of an art than a science. And um, we don't agree with that. You know, the, <clears throat> we're dealing with a, with a, a very uh, a technical product. It's uh, very sophisticated. And you know, science doesn't tell you absolutely everything. Science is the process of gradually getting more, closer and closer to the truth of what's going on, okay? Always a transformer expert needs to be, needs to be uh, consulted to make a determination of what to do with, a, with an asset, uh, regardless of how you think of DGA, okay? So it's not an art, it really is a science, and you can apply, okay, why is this not moving over? There we go. You can apply the scientific method to improve the interpretation of dissolved gas analysis data. Okay, and the scientific method is very simple. You observe a situation that you think you can improve on or there's some unknowns that you wanna figure out. You look at areas of research and dig into them, figure out what it is. Based on that research, you come up with a hypothesis that you want to test you know, or, or prove or disprove. You experiment to test the hypothesis, come up with some analysis and conclusion. And this is an iterative process. Okay, where you gradually get better and better and better information. Okay, it's not an art. This is truly a scientific method and should be treated as such. Okay, so how did we apply this? Oh, 
Well, here's the observations when we looked at conventional DGA interpretation methods. We found from our customer base that um, there are many times false positives, that is false alarms. And when you have false alarms and you're pursuing them, um, that, that's basically non-value added work and they can create maintenance inefficiencies or uh, in some cases, if people were just ignoring information and it was changing, but people weren't paying attention, it introduced an element of risk that you actually might miss something that's real. Um, there were a number of um, transformer failures that were notable that it was a better understanding of the fault gas behavior could have been avoided. So there are some misses as well um, with the existing methods. <clears throat> and we also got feedback that you know, even though some transformers have high volumes of gas, high concentrations of gas, they were comfortable with them continuing to operate. And that was, that was curious. Um, and we'll dig into that in, in a few minutes. And the conventional inter inter interpretation methods, they apply um, basically a simple, let's look for the outliers, okay? Which makes sense if you don't have better information but there has, to, we think there should be a better way because when you think about reliability, you want to understand and detect behavior leading to failure as opposed to just assuming that all the outliers are going to lead to failure. And as many people know, you're having to look at six or nine gases and trying to figure out what they mean can be quite complicated. So what can we do to improve this? So we dug in. First of all, <clears throat> so the areas that we, that we want to do research in is, could the data be simplified? And if so, um, we know that some transformers lose gases along the way for a variety of reasons. Can we account for that? Can we eat more easily, relate fault gas production with other events on your network, such as overloading, through faults, etc.? And most importantly, can we do a better job associating fault gas production with transformer failures? So these are the areas that we started to dig into and try and figure out. So the paper was written in uh, 2015 by Freddie Jacob. He's a chemist. He is one of the um, one of the pioneers of dissolved gas analysis. If you don't know him, uh, really smart guy and. He realized that you know we there was a there was a combined metric you know IEEE had tried to simplify it, it was to, total dissolved combustible gases, but it applied equal weight to all the gases, which didn't make sense because you know simply put we all, we all know acetylene is far worse than than methane or ethylene, and so he looked at it and says okay, <clears throat> let's figure out a different way of of measuring a fault and realizing that the gases were sim simply a symptom of the problem uh, that resulted from energy being ex expended that shouldn't be, okay, so can we get a measure of that energy? And uh, he figured out, yes, let's figure out how much energy is required to convert a molecule of um, the insulating oil into a molecule of each of the key gases, which is what you see on the left, and also a molecule of the paper into the uh, carbon oxide gases, which is what you see on the right. And the result of that is that could be put into a, um, a formula that creates what was referred to as a fault energy index. Okay, so now you have some indication of how much energy is going into a particular fault. Okay, and then this can be more better used to assess uh, severity and also detect uh, faults. So what, what do we do to this? Well, this is a typical graph of um, the hydrocarbon gases uh, for dissolved gases. Um, in this case, none of the gases go above any um, stated limits within the IEEE guidelines. And unless you are a very experienced person in this, you would not necessarily detect a problem here. With that formula, 
this data can be converted to the graph below, okay? And I'll get into why we have two, two different lines there in just a minute, but it is much more clear uh, of the behavior and the trend of, of this particular um, data, okay? So now we have a, um, what we call normalized energy intensity. It's a fault energy index. It's easy to calculate. And it was found that it responds smoothly as the fault type evolves. Okay, accounting for gas loss. Well, <clears throat> thinking about it, if energy is being expended in a fault, once that's expended, you never get it back. Okay, but um, if you're not paying attention to, you know, the gases that are being lost, you're not accounting for that energy. Okay, and, and that can create a problem. Okay, and so if you can't recognize that you have gas loss, then you'll underestimate the fault severity. And also we found that the data and the assessments for breathing and non-breathing transforms was, created, was treated the same when it really shouldn't be. And so looking at that graph again, okay, the, the raw calculation of the data creates this dotted line on the bottom, okay? Again, it looks flat. It looks like not much is really going on, except as I said, you know, once the energy is expended, you know, you're not gonna get it back. You really have got a fault and you really just need to look at the cumulative data which is what the solid line is indicating. And you see that there's a continuous um, behavior of uh, fault energy being expended and gas production, okay? Which is indicative of a problem, okay? You can't necessarily account, knowing that you um, only look at DGA samples typically once a year, you can't necessarily account for all um, gas laws but you can get a sense that you are losing gas and better uh, offset it. The red boxes indicate periods of gassing, specific periods of gassing. There are times when you are not gassing. And <clears throat> with this, with this uh, fault energy index, you can better see um, periods that might correlate or associate, be associated with other events on your network, like through faults, uh, periods of peak load, that type of thing as well. So now that we have this fault energy index, what can we do with it? Can we associate it with failures? <clears throat> and it took a while to figure it out, but we came to the realization that um, like a car, you know, and you're, if you're buying a used car, you not only want to know how old the car is, age has a factor for how reliable the car might be, but how many miles are on the odometer because the car is not always driving. And similarly, you know, the fault energy index um, is the odometer of the transformer as it pertains to dissolved gases because transformers aren't always gassing. So when we looked at that and started to look at, and we were very fortunate that two of our large customers gave us their failure data, we created this association of failures with the fault energy index from two different customers. And when you look at these curves, they look very similar. And in fact, uh, from a mathematical perspective, they are called, uh, referred to as being statistically indistinguishable. <clears throat> and hence, um, with that, we could combine the data. And once we combined the data, we were able to smooth the curve so that then we had something that we could build an algorithm on. This is called the survival curve, okay? And this survival curve can be transformed into a failure curve, which looks something like this. This was a big aha moment for us because, you know, a couple of very notable things uh, about this. You know, conventional methods basically infer that the more dissolved gases you have, the more at risk you are of a failure. 
but we had heard time and again from transformer experts that they were comfortable with some of their transformers having large quantities of gas, uh, but and still gassing and still operating them. And we were curious about this. And they said, hey, these transformers have demonstrated that they're more robust, or yes, there's lots of gas through some interesting gassing history, but they're not gassing very much now. So, you know, you know, we've got uh, bigger fish to fry. So we're going to just keep operating that particular transformer. And now we have a curve that illustrates what those transformer experts have been telling us. And, and what it's saying here is that for any transformer, if it's never gassed before, it could be a brand new transformer or a 30 year old transformer. Once it starts gassing, its likelihood of failure increases very rapidly. But then it comes to a peak and the likelihood of failure actually starts coming down. Okay, once it gets over that peak, okay, it, you know, it's demonstrated the level of robustness that it can continue go operating and its likelihood of failure actually reduces. Not, doesn't ever come down to zero, okay, so don't take it for granted, but that's, now we have data that supports what the transformer experts were telling us, okay? The other thing that really jumped out at us is that, you know, the conventional methods typically, you know, don't start raising flags until, you, until a transformer hits that 90th percentile mark. Well, that 90th percentile on this case is around here to the right of the peak. So if you're not if you're not starting to look at a particular transformer until it comes into the 90th percentile group, you're missing the most critical period of gassing for that transformer. Okay? Okay, so that was some pretty interesting things that came out of, out of this analysis. Okay. Now this curve, one of the things I must emphasize this, about this curve this curve represents the behavior of a very large population of transformers, okay? Um, so it doesn't represent how any one particular transformer will behave. Yeah, and that's, that's an important thing. So you basically have a model that now you can take a transformer and you can compare it to, okay? So now we have this dotted line that represents the current fault energy index of a specific transformer that you want to compare with the model. So what can we do with this? Well, it's already expended all the energy. It's gotten to this point on the x-axis. The area under the curve is referred to as the cumulative severity. It indicates the percentage of transformers in that population that if they gassed and gotten to that level of uh, fault energy on the fault energy index uh, axis, they would have failed, okay? If the transformer is still gassing, continues to gas, we can track how quickly it's gonna move to the right and come up with a hazard factor, which gives you more of a forward-looking view of what's going on. Cumulative severity tells you, wow, how lucky I've been to get here. It's more of a rear view look. But hazard factor tells you, you know, what, how risky your behavior is going forward. Okay. And if you calculate hazard factor for all the transformers in your fleet, <clears throat> then you can use that to compare and set priorities for maintenance and replacement. So just a couple of examples of numbers. These don't seem like very big numbers, but if you understand, um, the typical um, failure rate across the whole population in, in the industry is typically around 0.5% per year. You know, in this particular example, this behavior, the hazard factor indicates that this transformer is at least three times more likely to fail than any of its peers. And you should probably do something about that. Okay. So that was a bunch of interesting research that, that occurred and some new knowledge that we have. So having that information, can it be applied such that we can get 
better results than conventional VGA. That is, more correctly identify problematic transformers. And when we say more correctly, I mean we avoid false alarms and we better identify um, transformers that actually have problems. And then also, because the conventional methods tend to group things in um, basic categories, like a one, two, three type category method, uh, or, or green, yellow, red, when you have a large fleet, you can get a large quantity of reds or yellows, but how do you sort them out within that group? Can we create a better ranking system? Okay, so let's start experimenting and figuring this out. Let's, we were uh, fortunate enough, you know, to be able to apply this at a large fleet. Now the whole premise here is, if you think about, <clears throat> you know, um, a fleet of transformers, and these red dots represent the ones that have um, uh, evolving faults, and we separate them just for convenience in this diagram, what we're trying to do is do a better job identifying <clears throat> the problematic ones. And we referred to the method as reliability-based DGA, okay? And this is for illustrative purposes. The intent is to, you know, have fewer false alarms and, and fewer misses, okay? This, this data is just for illustrative purposes to capture the concept. And while these improvements seem relatively modest, okay, when you're talking about assets that are worth millions of dollars, um, they can add up quickly in terms of value. Okay, so what actually happened is that a large utility um, had a failure while this model was being developed, and we were fortunate enough to be able to um, apply it to that particular failure because that conventional DGA did not detect the failure um, or predict it. And in looking at the data, reliability-based DGA did detect it, and the utility asked us to look at their entire fleet. And what came out of that is that we looked at um, a fleet of 7,200 transformers and we did a side-by-side -side comparison and both methods, conventional DGA and reliability-based DGA detected around 1,700 transformers, but only 730 were common. That was, uh, that was pretty shocking, quite frankly. It didn't have as big an overlap as this illustration suggests. Okay, so digging into that and doing some analysis, that would suggest that what conventional DGA had detected, but hadn't been flagged by reliability-based DGA might be false alarms. And in fact, the utility confirmed more anecdotally that those particular, that particular set of transformers, they were quite happy to continue operating. What they were more concerned about was this group that reliability-based DGA had detected because that one had failed was part of this set. So they started digging into this set. And on the first 68 units they checked, 63 were confirmed to have problems. Two had bad data and we had three false alarms. They were much, they were much uh, happier uh, with these results. As a result of this, this particular utility uh, has chosen to adopt reliability-based DGA as their primary screening method for their transformer fleet. Okay, well, let's keep going. That, that, was, uh, that was a fortunate opportunity to, uh, to apply it, um, but let's get more rigorous about this. And we were kind of, kind of curious, and some of our customers were curious about how um, the 2008 version of C57104 compared with 2019, and in fact, how it compared with the IEC standard uh, and what, how reliability-based DGA stacked up, which was a very different method indeed. So in doing that, oh, before I get into that, you know, going into the simple one, two, three um, categorization, which helps you know, quickly draw your eye to where 
uh, problems might uh, might occur. You know, within reliability based DGA, there's also a realization that we needed we needed that simple characterization, and but we refer to this as gassing status as opposed to DGA st status, where gassing status one are transformers that have never ever uh, demonstrated any gassing. Um, so DGA doesn't tell us anything about um, the condition or state of those transformers. So DGA doesn't raise any flags. If a transformer has had a colorful gassing history, but it's not currently gassing, well, DGA still doesn't tell us anything um, and uh, of, of its current state. That's gassing status too. They're okay from a DGA perspective. And gassing status three uh, is where you have now a moderate amount of gassing uh, that's occurring right now. And gassing status four is extreme gassing. And we discern the difference between um, state three and state four using the hazard factor. And in fact, the hazard factor can also allow you to rank your transformers within each state. Okay, so now you can do a better job if you have a large fleet to uh, rank your transformers and assess them. Okay, so how do, how, how do these methods um, compare? Five utilities were kind enough to share their data, including their failure data. And so we had a set of 15,000 transformers. And what you see here is that, and, and what, what we were aiming to do is do a strict application of the standards as provided by the, uh, by the uh, standards organizations. What you see here is um, IEC is really trying to hone in on those that are most critical. So this is sort of an ideal world is let's just look at these ones that are most critical and everything else you don't really need to pay as much attention to. All the other methods say, mm, no, maybe not. I think you need to pay attention to more. But again, you see um, large sets of state four in the old 2008, uh, a notable set of state three in the 2019 version, a very large set of state three. So you have to go through all, you know, almost a third of your population in more detail to figure out uh, where the worst cases are, and then uh, a smaller set of state two. Uh, when they moved from 2008 to 2019, they reduced the one, two, three, four categorization to just one, two, three. Um, Reliability-based DGA using the hazard factor, um, a small amount of state four, and then state three, um, where we put a 0.05% hazard factor as a point of demarcation to say, hey, some are worse than others. But again, within that whole population, you can actually rank each individual transformer. So doing a little bit more analysis on this, the other interesting thing is they didn't all agree on which transformers were um, demonstrating risky behavior. They all agreed that there was a set of 4,000, almost 4,200 transformers that were all okay as far as DGA was concerned, okay? But in terms of the ones that were risky, so that left, you know, almost 11,000 transformers out, of which they only agreed on 243 um, that, was, that, that needed attention. Okay, this is, uh, <clears throat> this is a very interesting diagram from this perspective. You'll notice that IEC, it doesn't uniquely identify any at, the, at this point, and very few. And reliability-based DGA uniquely identifies 1,300. The 2008 version of IEEE uniquely identifies 1,500. And the experience that that we've seen is that um, these often are a large number of false, false alarms. Okay, so there's a, quite a bit of disagreement be, between them. 
Now, keep in mind, you know, from before, um, it is useful to look at different perspectives. So you want to have a software tool that can give you and um, apply multiple methods for interpreting. Okay, so you want to look at perhaps, you know, this, the application of a standard, perhaps reliability-based DGA and compare. And then, then you have more information upon which to make a decision. We decided, okay, well, that's interesting. Let's just look at the failures. And we went through that whole population and picked out all the failures that were DGA related. There were other failures in the population that were not DGA related, you know, things like bushings and things and so, so on. But there were 307 that were DGA related. And let's just look at uh, how the methods uh, detect those. Okay. Well, again, um, while we thought that IEC was just homing in on those that were going to be problematic, in fact, it, um, the proportions didn't change that much. Okay. And IEC had an awful lot of misses here uh, in this particular case. 2008, okay, flagged um, state four, uh, almost a third of them, another third in state three, doing not too bad. Um, missed about 23% of them in, 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 its, in their entirety. And IEEE 2019 made a large population being read, um, but again, a complete miss on about a third of them. Reliability-based DJ was a little bit better in that, you know, identified extreme cases, about 20% of this population is extreme cases. And then a large set in state three, where you could discern where there's um, what, what was considered the worst cases within the state three. And that 10% were complete misses here, the, the state ones. And there was another 15% that had some gassing history. And we suspect that the gassing history had basically set these ones up so that if you had another event like a through fault, it was just wait, waiting to fail, basically. We're doing some work now to try and uh, see if we can better detect uh, and uh, indicate uh, those that uh, are um, at risk of, of a fault event. Now let's again. Here's the interesting comparison. Again, they don't all agree on, on which ones are, are which. Um, <clears throat> And so 21 were missed by all methods. And they agreed on 30 of those 307. So ideally you wanna use a method that captures the biggest set. And again, um, ideally you, you want to um, maybe have a couple, a tool that can allow you to look at a couple of different methods to identify um, transformers that are uh, behaving, exhibiting risky behavior. We're trying to figure out how to, uh, how to measure performance of these different systems. And in fact, there was a method called the receiving operating characteristic, because this is, when you're looking at data like this, it's actually a signal or data processing problem that has been used historically in radar systems, uh, which is all about signal processing, where you're trying to distinguish between enemy aircraft and flocks of geese, you know, true positives versus false positives. And there is such a method and, and we were able to, to apply it. And if you think about flipping coins, you know, this dotted, dotted line going straight up the diagonal, this is coin flipping, okay? And the whole idea is to maximize the area of the curve. And you can, um, you can see that the, uh, the coin flipping line um, covers 50% of, um, of the area, which makes sense. So how do you improve upon that? And the gold standard is being up here and 
90, at least 95% of the time, you'll have a correct um, detection of, of an enemy aircraft, or in this case, a faulty transformer, okay? And what we saw here is that, you know, there's a lot of detail in here. Um, the IEC method is the purple line. The IEEE methods are these lines here. And reliability-based DGA is this line that um, wraps around them. So again, it's not a tremendous improvement over conventional methods, but it is a, a modest improvement. And when you're thinking about assets worth millions of dollars, um, then those improvements uh, add up quickly. Okay, so what have we found out about this? Well, uh, again, utility, the utility uh, gave us the data for the first experiment. Um, they adopted reliability-based DGA and they continue to be happy with it as a primary screen for the transformers. The fault energy indices do simplify the data, make it easier to allow for, and also help us account for gas loss um, that we can identify at risk transformers that otherwise might go undetected. IEEE 2019 and reliability based DGA are similar for flagging the majority of failure cases, but you, um, IEEE 2019 has a slightly higher false negative rate and a somewhat materially higher false positive rate. The hazard factor can be used to rank um, the highest to lowest risk cases. And in fact, you can use that hazard factor and multiply it by a criticality and come up with um, you know, a real strong risk index. On the ROC curve, reliability-based DGA had the largest area under that curve. And it was generally, a uh, deemed that reliability-based DGA did, in fact, uh, outperform the con conventional methods, hence proving the hypothesis. And I go back to what this is, is DGA is a science, it's not an art, and we have to keep going around the iterative process of observation research hypothesis, experiment analysis, come up with conclusions and improve the method to um, get better, better information, better insights into your fleet using the existing DGA data that you have. And that brings us to an end. Question is, can you give us some insight on the differences of dissolved gas analysis in natural or synthetic esters versus mineral oil? Oh, yes. So we have to do some work there yet. Um, we know that the enthalpies of formation that create the fault energy indices are a little bit different. Um, we don't have that data yet. Uh, that's one of, one of our next to-dos. But in talking to the various chemists, we know it's very similar. So, um, so we, once we get those metrics, we can, we can do the math. But realizing that when the fault energy index is an indicator of the fault energy, that's the same metric across, the, across each. How you get to the actual number is different because of the different material. But uh, we, have been, uh, we have been looking at it uh, on some cases and find that the behavior appears to be very similar, uh, but we can't say that um, with absolute uh, certainty yet. But we expect it to be very similar. Okay, thanks. Okay, the next question. You mentioned if the transformer passes the peak of FEI, then it will be more robust. Well, some issues identified by gases are irreversible damages, specifically to the paper insulation. Please elaborate. Yes, it's not that it will be more robust. It's demonstrated more robust behavior. Um, and again, it's a model and statistics are not black and white. Um, but there are cases where, you know, it might be paper that's on the bushing. That's just now it's burned off. It's gone away. Okay. And it's no longer there. It's not great, but it's no longer, it's not in the winding. Okay. 
So the carbon oxides are no longer being generated um, and it still, it still exists there and you don't have, <clears throat> it's not uh, demonstrating a problem. And this is more of a conceptual idea because they haven't necessarily gone inside the tank and verified that the paper is from the bushing. Um, but, you know, that particular, that transformer expert has deemed, hey, we're not seeing risky behavior anymore. There's no long, no more gases being, being generated. Um, we're happy, you know, we, we have bigger fish to fry, other problems to, to, to solve. We're happy to continue operating. The point is, is that we have a model now that says, yes, those, those have been good decisions, okay? Or you can support that decision, understanding that, that the data now demonstrates it as opposed to assuming that the more gas you have, the more at risk you are. Um, it's hard to describe because there have been so many different variations of cases from different transformer experts. Um, you know, we know some, some transformers, we've heard of some transformers where they're, they still have a large amount of acetylene, relatively large amount of acetylene in the tank because they've never um, degassed it. But that was a one-time event apparently that they weren't prepared to, uh, to go and degas it and they are confident that the event's not going to occur again. So it's just having, you know, when you're, when you're trying to bring in new engineers and, and relate data or, you know, or science to how you, how you actually operate and, and they, they scratch their head and say, wait a second, the standard says the more gas you have, you should take it offline. And the experienced engineer says, no, that one's okay. We're gonna leave it for now and here's why. They scratch their heads. Well, the standards, you know, they're, they're just trying to apply the standard, but <clears throat> the standard isn't quite correct. The conventional method isn't quite correct. And that was the point that we were trying to get to is, is, is the conventional method correct or not? Um, is there data that supports the fact that some transformers, you know, have had a colorful gassing history as, uh, as our founder, Jim Tukarm likes to say, um, and, and they may have a lot of scars and tattoos, but <clears throat> it's okay. It's okay, and they, and they can continue operating. I don't, I, that was kind of a, a vague answer, I think. Um, but I, I hope I got to... When we have a transformer with DGA results giving increasing gas concentrations, can we degas the transformer oil to temporarily prolong the unit and keep it running until a permanent unit off, which is often a long lead time, is ready to be installed. Yeah, degassing a unit will not solve the problem. Okay. All you've done is you've removed the symptom. Yeah. Um, but you still have, the problem is still underway. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, I think, I think you'll, you will have to, you know, you, you, I mean, it's, it, it's all on a case by case basis, but simply put, degassing will not solve the problem. Right. You, you may have to derate the transformer and, and have a reduced load. It all depends on what the situation is. Okay. The next question Does G G DGA depend on transformer lamination quality, loading patent, and transformer cooling performance? Cooling performance, for sure. Um, we've certainly seen many transformers. Uh, gassing with simply as a result of uh, the cooling fans being broken uh, and things like that. Um, the other two items I cannot comment on. Let's get into a little, little bit more detail and I've got uh, a word. Okay. The next question uh, is, uh, so, so of the confirmed failures, IEEE V219 caught three times more failure, 60%, than RDGA 20%. Uh, no, that's not correct. Okay. What you, what you saw there, if I go to that diagram, that's an important. Okay, let me do that. There, this is what we're referring to. 
I think so, yes. Yeah, so what's actually occurring here is that um, of 307 transformers, the 2019 version caught 70%. Mm -hmm. Okay, reliability-based DGA caught um, 75% and in fact had identified another 15% that's had problems in the past. Okay, now the thing to, to pay attention to when you're trying to say, okay, well, let's raise, you know, let's make it a three, you know, a three bell alarm, you know, the area, the red area. If we go back to, hang on a second, we just gotta go find it. Here, Okay, on the, when you're looking at the total population, proportionally speaking, okay, I, the 2019 version flagged 30% of the population of the entire population. Okay, so that it had a large, large group of these 15,000 transformers were in state three. Reliability-based DGA only flagged 3.1%. Okay, of that entire population. Now, when you when you look at the set of three hundred and seven there, okay, that thirty percent doubled. The proportion doubled. Okay, well that's good, but that means there must have been an awful lot of false alarms too, realizing it's thirty percent of fifteen thousand transformers. Here, you know the three percent. You know, multiplied by six in the state four. So we were more correctly flagging the appropriate transformers that had problems. We need to dive into the numbers. I don't think we have a have time to do that today, but I, I hope you get the sense of that. Sure. Okay, this is this is not saying that this this captured more or better that way. It's saying it's more. <clears throat> both methods identified a large set of problematic transformers, mm -hmm. but which ones are doing it more correctly and which ones are not creating false alarms. Okay, then, <clears throat> and the final question is, are there certain problematic situations that are found easier with our DGA than others? Uh, well, certainly, you know, um, Transformers that expel gas. Um, so when you have gas loss, and that is transformers that have gas loss because of a, of a leaky seal, or they're free breathing, or they purposely expel gas because they're nitrogen blanketed and you know they relieve pressure from time to time. Uh, Reliability-based DGA has, has been um, doing a better job identifying those as an example. Um, Reliability-based DGA has, um, that, that is a classic one that we're finding time and again. Okay. There is uh, additional things that we're doing right now, particularly looking at uh, carbon oxide ratios, but that can be applied to the IEEE method as well. Uh, if, although it doesn't really dive into it too deeply, but we are finding the carbon oxide ratios are giving us uh, some particularly good information in terms of where a fault might be and um, the level of risk associated with that particular fault.